Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very excited to be here in this very, very fine um, um, venue. I can't work out whether it's an art gallery. From my point of view, it's like an art gallery. I was checking where there was a constable over there, but it's not. It says made in Hong Kong in very small letters in the background. We're really, truly delighted to be here celebrating um, one of the greatest jazz pianists of all time. I'll talk about him and his association with Bose and for a minute, but uh, this is one of his tunes from the Night Train album from 1962. This is the Sea Jam Blues.
was to see Jam Blues. We're very excited to be here, as I said. I'd like to apologise for you part of the audience uh, as I have my back to you. That's, uh, it's just one of those things when you play the piano trio. And if you play like Oscar Peterson, in this is the way he always set up with the piano this side of the stage, because he liked to be as physically close as in position of heads to the musicians he was playing. Because the trouble with the piano is the drums are right over there and the bass is in the middle. It's quite, sometimes there's a bit of a time lapse. Um, anyway, that's the reason why, in case you want I'm very excited to be playing this piano, which is the same price as most houses. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no, it's not, because of inflation. This is only £124,000. <laughs> but that's quite nice. That's why it's got this uh, cellophane on it. <laughs> the cellophane itself is worth £5,000. <laughs> Um, well, as I said, we're here to celebrate one of the greatest pianists of all time, a man who had a great career as a, um, not only a, as a jazz musician, but as a, a, a musician. He had a TV programme called The Piano Party, um, and uh, he was very much a prodigious ambassador for jazz. He was born in Canada in 1925 into a semi-musical family, though his father worked on the railroad and travelled across Canada and would bring him and his sister Daisy various souvenirs from various places in Canada, you know, sort of pictures of the Rocky Mountains and elephants and things like that, that he would have a collection of, which appeared later on in his life when he wrote Canadiana Suite, which I'll talk about. And originally, Oscar started off as a trumpet player. Um, and you wouldn't normally say this, but a great thing happened is he suffered from tuberculosis. As a result, he had to give up the trumpet and concentrate on the piano. And uh, in those days, Playing the piano, well, it's still, when you learn piano, even if you're a jazz pianist, you tend to learn through the classics, like Bach, you know. Which is fine, because there's lots of other music. But in the 1920s and 30s, that's the only way you learned music. You didn't learn jazz piano, because jazz piano was sort of emerging at the time. So um, Oscar would have been playing all this stuff. And then one day, his father, Daniel, came back with a record of a pianist called Art Tatum, who was an amazing pianist. Um, Art Tatum was blind in one eye, he had bad cataracts in the other eyes. Um, he could hardly see anything, but yet he played the piano like the sort of the horror bits of jazz. And uh, when Oscar first heard this recording of Tiger Rag, from this... <laughs> Certainly, it, certainly, this was the epiphanal moment for Oscar when he ceased to. Oh, I mean, obviously, he carried on practicing the classical. He then went to learn with an amazing Hungarian piano teacher, um, and uh, uh, but essentially, he then that was it. the seed was set, and he started practicing very hard to become to play like Art Tatum, and uh, it was fine. But he was in Canada. There wasn't much jazz around in Canada in 1930s, 19, early, late 1930s. And it wasn't really until the 1940s that he got his break. And it happened purely by accident. He won a competition when he was 13. The competition, which was the sort of the equivalent of the X Factor in Canada. <laughs> the prize was your own radio show. How cool is that? He was 13, and every Sunday, you could write to the Radio Toronto and get Oscar Peterson, who was 13, to play your requests. And that's what he did. And he did it for five, six years of his life. And you would ring up and you would say, oh, I'd like you to play tenderly. And then baby Oscar would be like... And then the next person would ring up and say, oh, can you play t for two? Or whatever it was. And he would play it. Um, it wasn't until about sort of a... Uh, 1940, I think, uh, well, I can't remember, it would have been 18 anyway at the time, um, so it actually would have been 1942, uh, that Norman Grant, who was a promoter, was on tour with the Jazz at the Philharmonic, which had Ella Fitzgerald, Charlie Parker, Roy Eldridge, Ray Brown, Herb Ellis, all these great jazz stars of the day. And they were playing in Montreal. And uh, 
On his way after this concert, Norman Grants um, was in the taxi and went to the airport, and the airport was playing this radio show. And he said to the driver, he said, who's that man playing the piano? I've never heard anything like it. And uh, the taxi driver said, oh, that's Oscar Peterson. He's broadcasting live from this hotel around the corner. So Norman Grant said, turn the car around. <laughs> that's exactly what happened. And he went and he literally signed Oscar Peterson, at the age of 18, to Verb Records. Um, and four weeks later, and this is where the story gets a bit sort of jazzy and tenuous, in other words, made up. <laughs> <laughs> He, four weeks later, he made his Carnegie Hall debut, which is very exciting. But there was a clause in the law, which still to this day is still hard for us um, UK musicians and Canadians to work in New York, which is the hub of jazz by this time. Um, and because he was Canadian, he wasn't allowed to work there. So Norman Grant had to stage a stunt, and he did it in the Carnegie Hall. Jazz at the Philharmonic, there was a packed concert. You had um, um, Hank Jones was the pianist. And he said to Hank, he said, Hank, is it possible would it be theoretically possible if during a number you could suddenly hurt your arm? Now, how many pianists are there in the audience? There's a few. It's very rare, isn't it, that you're in the middle of playing <laughs> and suddenly your arm starts hurting. That never happened to me, ever. But anyway, this is what happens. So Hank Jones is playing away, and suddenly he looked at his hand as if it was the devil and uh, stopped playing. Norman Grant comes on the stage in the Carnegie and says, ladies and gentlemen, this is an absolute emergency. Hank Jones has heard I don't suppose there's any pianists in the audience. And up gets Oscar Peterson, age 19. And that's how he made his Carnegie Hall debut. And because he was Canadian, he wasn't allowed to officially work there. So nobody actually knew who it was. So it was a sort of debut without the sort of, you know, the adulation. But it soon emerged. And that's how Oscar's career sort of took off. And one of the pieces he played at that time was T for Two. So we'll do a quick version of that. because I've been talking far too long before. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Oscar Peterson, also, I forgot to say, he based um, the sound of the original Oscar Peterson trio, it didn't have the drums in it, it was uh, the same um, as the Nat King Cole trio, which had guitar, bass, and piano, and it was a different sort of sound, because the, all the guitar was this sort of El Mar type thing. And then uh, the original trio, and Oscar also used to sing as well, which was an interesting thing, because in the 1950s, the early 1950s, both Nat Cole and Norman Grant and, and Oscar Peterson were managed by Norman Grant. And he had worked out that it would be better if Nat Cole, who was also a piano trio, started to stop playing the piano and concentrate on singing, and if Oscar stopped singing and concentrated on the piano, <laughs> it was a wise move, so I think you'll all agree. And uh, so uh, from that day, Oscar stopped singing in public, and Nat Cole stopped almost playing the piano in public. And all those classic albums that Nat Cole did, it was always George Shearing on the piano for The Unforgettable and all those sort of things, and it's quite interesting. Uh, even though Nat Cole was an amazing piano player. And when Nat Cole died, Oscar Peterson did an album called Remembering Nat, and he sings on this album, and he sounds exactly like Nat King Cole. <laughs> so you can sort of understand why Norman Grant's had a bit of a dilemma on his hand. Well, Oscar, you know, playing jazz piano, um, anyway, to this day, you often play, often play a mixture of jazz standards, which in those days were Broadway show songs or pop songs of the day. You play blues, spirituals, gospel, a bit of boogie woogie. Oscar was really good at boogie woogie, which is this one. You can do that really fast. You can carry on like that forever, especially if you're Jules Holland. Um, <laughs> the, fun thing is about, the fun thing is about playing the piano <laughs> is that very rarely when you play the piano, and as I know there are a few pianists here, you get to perform on your own instrument. Whereas violinists can always take their instruments, Arnie will always take his own bass or nick it from someone else, <laughs> and Chris will have to take his drums. But pianists very rarely get to play on their own instrument unless you're Elton John or Oscar Peterson. When he actually did discover the Bosendorfer later on in his life, he insisted on having this imperial Bosendorfer carted everywhere he played. The first time he played at Ronnie Scott's in 1972, I think, the, he played on this imperial Bosendorfer, which is a bit long, another five foot longer than this one. And uh, it was bigger than the stage at Ronnie Scott's. <laughs> and uh, therefore, the drums had to go in the audience the first time, um, much to Martin Drew's chagrin, he was a bit upset about it at the time. But never mind, he kept giving free drinks whilst he was playing. Um, anyway, um, so in addition to playing jazz, dance, blues, and all the music of the day, Oscar Peterson also wrote a lot of great songs. And uh, we're going to play one of his now. This is one called Hallelujah Time. And uh, it's a, a typical Oscar Peterson piece. You know, Oscar had his way of playing was, you know, very distinctive. Because he was so technically good at the piano, he could play almost like anybody. He could do the stride like Art Tatum. He could do the George Sheeran block chords, which he would do much more fast. So George Sheeran had this lovely sort of sexy sound. You can imagine the sort of cocktails over there, you know. Sort of <laughs> really smooth. But Austin would take that idea and play it rapidly fast. The other thing about playing jazz piano, uh, unless you're playing a specific style like ragtime, etc., etc., you don't really know. There's the big curse of being a jazz pianist is what to do with your left hand, <laughs> literally. Um, without, uh, I mean, it literally is. Unless you're playing Errol Garner, which is very specific, which is this. specific style or boogie boogie which I've done. Basically your left hand just has to play chords. Now without the right hand, the left hand sounds like a piece of contemporary classical music, like this. So, 
But Oscar also, the other thing he would do is he would simply play with the same thing with his left hand as what he would do with his right hand. And suddenly you get this amazing, powerful sound. <laughs> Anyway, this is a tune called Hallelujah Time.
prolific. He did hundreds and hundreds of albums. Um, and in, I think, 1957 and 58, Norman Glantz suggested he did a series of albums called The Songbook Series, which was things like the George Gershwin Songbook, the Cole Porter Songbook, the Howard Arnold Songbook, the Frank Sinatra Songbook, the Duke Ellington Songbook, you name a songwriter who'd written more than 10 songs, there was a songbook, all done in 1957 or 58, 59. And he churned these albums out, as did Ella Fitzgerald. Ella Fitzgerald did the Howard Arnold Songbook, the Cole Porter Songbook, etc., etc. And uh, Oscar, um, played his on his uh, when he played ballads, he was absolutely wonderful. Um, so I'm going to play um, sort of a homage to Oscar's version of "Someone to Watch Over Me" by George Gershwin, and then seamlessly think into another tune called "The Man I Love," also by George Gershwin, um, from the uh, George Gershwin songbook. Well, it's not going to be from any other song, is it? <laughs> um, okay, here we go. <laughs>
Perfect. By the way, we're, gonna, we're not going to have a break. If you do need to go and have a little break, then you do, do feel free, don't worry. But because the bar isn't open anymore. So <laughs> if we'll just carry on, and then we can go to the pub. No, not at all. Um, I'm a bit out of breath after that. Um, if you watch films of Oscar Peterson playing, he was always covered in sweat, flying all over the place. Um, Covid didn't exist in those days, so we were out to do that. There was one, this is a true story, um, this is nothing to do with Oscar Peterson, but as part of my job as artistic director at Ronnie Scott's, I have to occasionally go, Whoa! thank you, it doesn't really mean much, but I occasionally have to go to meetings that have nothing to do with music, but it's to do with the food that is served in Ronnie Scott's, which over the years has got a history that's, well we won't bother talking about that, really a thousand flies can't be wrong, etc. <laughs> that was a Ronnie Scott joke. Anyway, one day I was there, this is a true story, I don't know why, I'm just having a little moment to breathe to tell the story. Um, anyway, the great um, singer, Buddy Greco, was appearing at the club and uh, he uh, was a pianist and singer and part of the Rat Pack. This is, that's the first thing you just remember that. Um, anyway, we're having this meeting and we had this French chef called Jean-Yves, and he was really into his arty-farty food and presentation, which works fine if you're in a French restaurant, but in a dark jazz club in, um, with very dim lights and everything's red in Ronnie Scott's and candle lit, it's very hard to tell what you're eating, let alone anything sort of gourmet <laughs> presented. So after six of these meetings, discovered working out how much what potatoes to use for chips and things like this. I was beginning to feel a bit artistically challenged, and then, but it didn't mind because it was interesting to see how other things happen in life. Anyway, that might be Johnny on the phone. So he's not <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so one day Johnny turned up on a Tuesday lunchtime to present us with the dish of the day, which was these garlic prawns in their shells, and I said, Johnny, this is wise to be serving garlic prawns in their shelves. He was no, naturally, of course it is. I said, it is really dark in there, anyway, there'd be prawns flying all over the place. He looked at me as if I was Lucifer and, uh, and walked off in a huff. And the, the then uh, uh, manager director said, look, we'll go with the prawns for a week. I know it's not going to work. And that very night, Buddy Greco was playing MacArthur Park. Uh, that song with Richard Harris, you know, uh, how's it go? Oh, yeah. I've never had to be in my life before with a prawn that's just landed on the piano. I just share that. So it has nothing to do with Lost Peterson at all. But it's just one of the sort of the day in the life of Ronnie Scott's behind the scenes. So you, next time you go to Ronnie Scott's, you will not see garlic prawns. On the um, one of the great things about the Oscar Peterson trio, when he then played with the drummer, um, is that he had a drummer called Ed Thigpen, a very unusual name, but he was a great drummer. And he sort of combined some of the classic rhythms. So, Chris, can you give an example of just a swing, a standard swing rhythm? If I said to play swing and fall, it would sound like this. Exactly. If I said to play a bossa nova, it would sound like this. So you can tell the difference me. So Oscar liked both rhythms, but he wanted to have a sort of rhythm that encapsulated both of them. So he persuaded his drummer to come up with a rhythm called the swing bossa, or the bossa swing, depending on what time, whether you're in you know, Soho or Manchester or whatever. It's called the swing bossa. So it's a combination of the both, isn't it? Can you give us a... In fact, why don't you do a little bit and then end up in the swing bossa. We'll play a tune called Corcovado, which is from the We Get Requests album by Oscar Peterson. That sounds like the recipe, doesn't it? Better than garlic prawns. <laughs> <laughs>
to this piano, which is 124,000 pounds, which I can't believe. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Um, the piano that Oscar played on it was the, called the Imperial Bosendorf, and it had a particular feature, um, which it had a little flap at the end of this part of the piano, which revealed some extra notes. There were an extra... There were an extra three, no, four notes. They were down there, and they were written, and for certainly some, some parts of Ravel and Debussy required the use of them in Messiaen, and uh, some of the great class, early 20th century classical composers. But Oscar, as soon as he discovered the piano with his extra notes, was very excited. <laughs> and it was called the Imperial Bosendorf. And you occasionally get them in recording studios. And it's quite exciting for me as a pianist when you do come across them. A bit later on, they just painted the notes black. And there's a reason why they did it. And when Oscar had his TV series called Piano Party, um, the great thing about putting two grand pianos together is they interlock a bit like a piece of a jigsaw. Um, so that you can have these amazing two piano concerts and the shape of the piano is interlocked, so you're literally facing the other pianist. Um, Oscar, in the 70s, had a programme called Piano Party and he would interview musicians like Andre Previn or um, uh, uh, Count Basie was one of them. And Oscar had a slightly cheeky sense of humour and uh, when he played stride piano, which is the umcha umcha, this one, playing very fast, in order to work out what notes to hit, you can't, your eyes can't see that, so you judge it by looking at the, the end of the piano, the black bit, um, the end of the wood. And so Oscar had asked Count Basie, he said, oh, when you play the kid from Red Bank, which is another piece of stride piano, he goes, how do you, what's your technique, Count? You know, I've got my technique for playing fast stride. And Count looked very amused at him, because he's, you know, it's such a stupid question to ask, because most, most pianists know that. And uh, he said, well, you just look at the bit at the end of the piano, Oscar, the, that's how you play the stride. Unbeknownst to Count Basie, Oscar had lifted up the flap. So <laughs> Count Basie, and you can see it on the film, he sounds like Les Dawson, he's playing the kid from Red Bank. Instead of sounding like this. Sounds like this. And it gets really confused, and then Oscar just calmly walks over pushes the flat back and says, I see, ladies and gentlemen, he's absolutely right. <laughs> the Count Basie was deeply humiliated and didn't speak to him for about three years. <laughs> so, um, it's very hard to do a concert um, when you're sort of, because Oscar Peterson plays so many pieces of music, there's so many people have their favourites. Um, but I thought it would be nice to finish with a couple of originals. Um, and in the 60s, he wrote this suite of music called the Canadiana Suite which is really beautiful and it has some amazing, there's about nine pieces um, called, there's a blues for the prairies, there's a piece about the Rocky Mountains, and it's basically his sort of tribute to his father and the railway journeys that he used to bring these trinkets and souvenirs to his sister Daisy, who also was a pianist as well. And uh, he wrote this amazing piece, um, which is a sort of depiction of the area he grew up called the Place St. Henri, which is a square in St. Henri in um, Montreal, Montre yeah, Montre Montreal, um, and it sort of sums up the busy, bustling market town that it was at the time, probably exactly like it probably is out there on the streets at the moment. Um, and so this is a really typical Oscar Peterson piece called The Place of Sonnery from Canadian on a Suite. Arnie really likes this piece. <laughs> How about it for these incredible musicians, by the way? <laughs> It's very nice to be part of the Manchester Jazz Festival as well. They've got some really cool, you should definitely check out. I mean, I know it's been going on, this is sort of the end of the festival now, isn't it? But um, I should definitely check out next year. Hopefully, we'll be invited back. Maybe I'll have to do another pianist next year. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is Classic St. Henri from the Canadian Suite.
possibly one of the beautifulest pieces of music that Oscar wrote. In fact, one of the most beautiful pieces of jazz music that gets played a lot, all the time. And uh, it's again from the Night Train album. It's Hymn to Freedom, which he wrote in uh, tribute to Martin Luther King, um, the US civil rights leader, the movement leader. And uh, this is an absolutely amazing piece. There's been loads of versions of it, symphonic versions. And um, the other thing, I tend to play this piece at the end because I've done all the various things that Oscar did, like the stride and the farcing. This also features a technique that Oscar did, which is called the rumble. And it's not to do with a fight, even though it can be sometimes a fight. But it's um, you rumble away, you tremolo, and you build up the resonance in the piano and in the room. It's quite, well, don't you wait till you hear it in the piece. But it tends to put the piano out of tune, so that's why I tend to put it out. <laughs> the piano's got to be out, but, but it actually it stood the test of Oscar Peterson. Um, it's a funny thing playing the piano, as I said. You never know what instrument you're going to get. I was once playing, years ago, with the Sid Lawrence Orchestra in Scarborough. And the theatre in Scarborough, has a, the stage has an, is an angle, it's called a rake. And the piano kept rolling forward <laughs> every time. And the saxophone players were playing In the Mood, which is this one. With those chords, with their bums, they were nudging the piano back. <laughs> so they would stop the piano from rolling for the whole gig. It wasn't just that, it was Moonlight Serenade and everything. They would kept to stop the piano from rolling forward because the brakes didn't work. Um, so, you know, that's just another, you know, the adventures of a pianist. Um, I shall share with you. There was another time I was playing. The lid, which is on this piano, there wasn't any hinges on it, but nobody had noticed. And we were playing some boogie boogie thing, and the lid literally just dropped off <laughs> into the orchestral pit. Um, anyway, saving that, so I've just got my breath back. This is, uh, as I say, this is Hymn to Freedom, one of the most beautiful pieces that Oscar wrote. And uh, if I said if you're going to get any uh, record of Oscar, get the Night Train album, because it's really cool. And before we play, I'd like to thank. The amazing, this amazing venue, Forsyth Music, at Art Gallery as well. Yeah. Uh, Simon and the team here, and, um, and uh, James, Sergeant from Yamaha, and uh, all the people that have made it possible, and for you guys coming to this concert. Because uh, without an audience, it would be very boring. <laughs> we would just be playing with ourselves. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's it. When we had the lockdowns, we, at Ronnie Scott's, we had to do loads of gigs without an audience, they were being streamed to the world. There were thousands of people watching. But it was really weird because there wasn't an audience. So when we did open up, and I'm sure it's the same with all venues, having an audience there and that reaction, you suddenly realize it's a two-way street. So we as performers really appreciate you guys coming out. So thank you very much for coming out. And I hope you enjoy this piece, Hymn to Freedom.
Sinatra, or do you want something by my fair lady? From my fair lady. You haven't done what you want. It's not going to be my way, don't worry. <laughs> we'll do Frank I did this project in which I did uh, some jazz verses of Cole Portitude, and this is an exact transcription of Oscar's version of At Long Last Love. So I'm going to have to use the music for the first bit anyway. Um, but it's quite cool. And uh, this is a long last love. Once again, thank you very much for coming, and uh, it's been a great pleasure performing with you.
<laughs> we do have slightly more affordable versions of it as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so this was a real highlight for us and amazing to be part of the Bashi Jazz Festival. But we are having an ongoing series of musical events here. We're doing about two or three concerts a month. We've done, this is our 22nd since we emerged from lockdown last year. Yeah. May that never happen. Thank <laughs> you.